Beautiful day here in Niels Arp Mountains, and recently we shared with you the concepts or the idea behind doing TSI, timber stand improvement, some people call it forest stand improvement, to improve a stand of hardwoods for wildlife habitat. Basically, opening up the canopy and allowing enough sun to reach the forest floor, that paired with the follow-up prescribed fire to stimulate the growth of native grasses and forbs. Almost everywhere in the United States has a good native seed bank. We're going into a stand that likely was a pasture way back in the day, then timbered and harvested and now grown back in the low quality habitat. And I'm gonna show you the techniques and herbicides I use to terminate the trees and more importantly, which trees I'm going to leave to convert this from really low quality wildlife habitat to very productive and aesthetically pleasing habitat. You take a chainsaw and just fell a hardwood tree. Almost all the species, the common ones, oaks, hickories, or whatever, they're gonna sprout back. They're gonna have stump sprouts come back and that can create more of a mess and shade out a bunch of area versus just leaving the tree standing. Now, sure enough, some of those species, uh, elms, some oaks, deer will eat the sprouts, depending on how heavy they are, and the brand new sprouts coming off an old mature root system are high in mineral content, nutrient content, deer will eat those. But when you work on a large patch of timber, they can't keep up with all those sprouts, and three or four years later, it's a thicket like a South Carolina clear cut. You can't see through it, it's not huntable, and it's gonna shade out all the high quality forage because those saplings are now 10 feet tall, full of leaves, and it will never mature into high quality timber. So, I want to terminate the trees and leave the best trees. And I could fell them and then treat the stump, but that's a lot of labor, intense and more dangerous. What we're doing this time of year we're, you know, we're in February, way before spring green up. I'm going to girdle the tree and I'm gonna put a herbicide in there, a milliliter or two per tree, not much at all. And through this summer, that tree may green up, it may not green up, but the herbicide will translocate to the root system and terminate the tree so I don't have all those sprouts everywhere. If I see a tree like a winged elm, I wanna leave for a sprout, I can just take my chainsaw, cut it off, not apply any herbicide and let that sprout back. I can control the amount of sprouts I'm gonna have per acre. Much better than a standard timber harvest where it just comes into a mess unless you follow up and replant. Before we start that, I'm gonna tell you what herbicides I use and how I mix them. Let me say up front, my good friend, Dr. Craig Harper, he's at Tennessee Martin, uh, professor of extension and wildlife biology there. Craig and I went to school together at Clemson, great guy. He's the guy that did the research that come up with this blend of herbicides. And I wanna make sure Craig gets the credit for the great research he did on that. He's helped many landowners, including me, with that herbicide blend. Craig's recipe, it's, it's commonly known as the Harper recipe, is 50% Garlon 3A. You always start with the Garlon first. Because if you put the Garlon and Arsenal together, it will make a gel and not be usable. 3A is important versus 4, not as soil active. So go on, use 50% Garlon 3A, 40% water. And you can see the water and the Garlon mixes really readily. And 10% Arsenal AC, applicators concentrate. Very good. Man, that's good. Now, all these are the name brands, and you can use the generics. I have generics of the Garlon. There's a lot of generics out there they're less expensive than that name brand product and work just as well. So I purchase mine online at the least expensive place I can find them when I purchase them. I don't have a particular store. I'm not in a big forestry area, so I doubt I could buy these chemicals at the local MFA or our local farm store because they sell mainly ag products, not tree or timber products. So you can buy these online and a little bit goes a long way. A, you know, quart squirt bottle full will cover a long way because you're, again you're losing a milliliter or two per tree and I mix in a plastic tub we're in a road an interior road right here at the Proving Grounds too but hardwoods on both sides of us if I kill this tree right here sooner or later it's going to follow the road and I'm going to come out here and cut it out so I mix over a tub if I accidentally spill some it's in a tub 
and I can dispose of that in a very safe area. Just as important as that, I use a blue herbicide dye. There's lots of those, you can get them online, just a little bit in there. There's no blue in the wild except a turkey's head every now and then. You know, you see yellows and oranges and other colors in leaves and funguses, but rarely blue. Blue shows up really well on timber, and that's so I know which trees I've treated and maybe if I forgot to treat one. But speaking of that, it's very important to treat within about five minutes of when you wound the tree or do the girdle because sap's gonna start coming out and you want that herbicide to be taken into the tree. Sap is what heals the tree and it's gonna come out and keep the herbicide from penetrating the circulatory system. And the circulatory system is the inner bark or right under the bark. You may remember from high school biology or something, xylem and phloem are combined to cambium layer, the tree's circulatory system. In the middle of a hardwood tree, like if you're looking at a stump, that's all dead wood in there. Those are cell structures like concrete blocks. They're to support the tree. Only living part of a hardwood stem is right below the bark, the cambium layer. When I'm cutting with my saw, I'm gonna be careful not to cut too deep. I'll make the tree weaker. It could fall over quicker, which leads me to another point. I get this email all the time. That's crazy, because you can never walk in the woods thinking a tree's gonna fall and hit you in the head and kill you. Really. Now be honest, because this is a pet peeve of mine. Daniel's back there laughing. It's a pet peeve of mine. How many times have you walked through the woods no one's with you. You come up to a dead tree and you wonder if I can push that over. And most time you can't. Be honest. Or how about that dead tree in your yard that your wife keeps telling you cut down and you just don't do it because you're fishing or hunting and it's been there for 10 years and fell on your kids. So first year or two, depending on snow, ice, a lot of factors, those little pinky sized limbs are gonna fall off they're gonna be air dried. They fall to the ground, break up a lot of times. And year two, three, four, getting a lot of variables, amount of rain, how, how low the humidity is, maybe inch, inch and a half limbs fall down. It's a long time before those stems fall down. And when they do, they're air dried. When they get ready to fall, yeah, you can take one hand and just push them over. So I don't consider it dangerous at all. Now, some people don't like the aesthetics Let's say you got one leaf tree and you kill 10 trees around it. That may not be something that's aesthetically pleasing. And if it bothers you that much, you're gonna need to fell the tree, treat the stump with herbicide, and lay it on the ground. I don't like that because they're a booger to drag deer across. The limbs are sticking up. To me, that looks bad. It stops fire if that limb's laying on the ground. Unless it's a real intense fire, the prescribed fire just get up to it and die, and you end up lighting over and over all day long. So I'd rather leave them stand them, let them weather and they decay, and it makes great woodpecker food because those dead trees will fill up with insects, and all but one species of woodpecker works on dead trees getting under the bark to get insects. So a lot of advantages to it. I'm not going to hack and squirt or girdle right on the edge of the road. I'm going to leave those trees, that timber, a little thicker because I know they're going to fall over. As we shared in that last video, you look back here, these trees have a much bigger crown over the road because they're starving. They're reaching for sunlight. So obviously they're going to fall that way. If you terminate trees right on the edge of the road or even a few feet back from the road, at some point they're going to block your road. So I give about a tree length, more or less buffer. Just leave that as it is and work from there on into the stand. One last thing, we use these sponge brushes. If I'm treating a stump, I don't take my squirt bottle and put it all over the ground, because again, that could be ground active. Arsenal is definitely ground active. There's 10% of blend, Craig's figured this out, so not much of a chance, it's only 10%, but I'm gonna spray my brush, my sponge brush, and just paint the outside edge. There's no need to put an herbicide in the middle, because that's all dead. I'm just barely painting the outside edge. And as I always say, I'm not anti-herbicide, but I don't want to use any more than I have to. So I'll just very carefully moisten my sponge brush, paint what I need to paint. I always take a can or something with me to put it in so it's not just getting sloppy all over. Certainly don't lay it on the ground. When I'm out there in the timber working, I'm gonna wear leather gloves when I'm running the saw 
and I keep a pair of rubber gloves, neoprene gloves, whatever, when I'm running this, because if you get a little dribbling on you, this stuff's not that toxic, but why risk it? You're not supposed to swallow toothpaste. I don't want herbicide running over my fingers. So, you know, a little common sense goes a long ways. We want to all be safe and live to do this a long time. Growing Deer is brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's. Also by Green Cover Food Plots, Winchester, PH Outdoors, Moultrie Mobile, Steel, Fleet Outdoor Apparel, Morel Targets, Fourth Arrow, Scorpion Venom Archery, Case IH Tractors, Ward Laboratories, Burris Optics, G5 Broadheads, Prime Bows, and Redneck Hunting Blinds. I start this always by finding a tree I want to leave. This is the biggest, best tree in this area. It's not a great tree, but biggest, best tree in the area. And I kind of get my back to it and I look around. So I'm going to take out these little stems here. That tr these double trees are going out because they're competing. They're never going to be good. And they're competing with moisture and stuff for this tree. And then I look around and figure out what trees I'm taking out, get that game plan before I start. Yeah. I know all you he-men out there don't want to hear this, but you can get injured. so. I wear leather gloves, good quality leather gloves when I'm running a chainsaw. Always chaps. Chaps are built. These are still chaps. These are the best, I believe. They're built so if a saw should hit them, layers peel away and bind up the saw. Just a second, you can really hurt your leg. I was working with a guy one time that wasn't wearing chaps. I took him to the emergency room. Fortunately, he could walk later on. Wear your chaps. I want to be able to hear deer and turkey, so I wear a helmet, of course, with a shield. I've got military grade sunglasses on, but I've got a shield I pull down and I've got my hearing, hearing protection. I'm using today a battery powered chainsaw. It is perfect for this application and it's not as loud, but it's still loud enough. I want to wear hearing protection. Last thing, I've got really solid, good quality leather boots on. You don't want to be out here with tennis shoes, right? You want to protect your body. So again, I find the tree I want to leave. I see the next tree I want to leave and I'm going to terminate in between. There's some little trees right here. And if they're an elm, I'll probably just cut them off, depending on how many there are per acre, let them stump sprout back and let the deer eat those stump sprouts. But I don't fell those trees first because I don't be walking all over them. I'm taking care of the small trees last. And if you just cut a small tree off, then I take that sponge brush and treat the stump or it's gonna sprout back. So this is my leaf tree. Now look right here, there's a eight or nine inch tree over here, two or three of them before I get to another good tree. So there's three big trees right there, a twin tree right here, double stem tree, a triple stem tree right there, and a double stem here. Those are the trees I'm gonna go to work with with the steel. Tim's gonna be following me up. Here have some neoprene or rubber gloves on, and he's going to apply the herbicide into that single girdle I make. Now it's real important for the girdle, it has to go all the way around the tree. If you leave a two or three inch gap, well that tree's gonna stay alive on that side because the circulatory system can go up there. So I go all the way around the tree. You may not get your line exactly together, but they've gotta overlap. If they don't overlap, if they overlap, well the tree's arteries, if you will, are run straight up and down and you're killed a tree. All right, we'll get to work and uh, just give you an example, we won't keep you all day, of how we do this. One thing I really like about these modern steel battery powered saws, you're not cranking all day. You let your finger off the trigger, it's dead. You pull the trigger, it's getting ready to go. And when you're one man out here working by yourself, you're girdling, spraying, girdling, spraying. That is a huge asset, huge asset. First thing I do, because I'm going to be circling this tree, is get anything out of the way that could be a tripping hazard. Just walk around and kick. Sometimes you don't have to, but if you do. And then if I've got something like this in the way, I don't want to pull it down. I got my steel in my hand, so. Get that out of the way so I'm not bumping into it. If I got a limb in the way, I'm going to take it off. Okay, this is a double tree, so a little more complicated. Here's a tip for you. I like to use the top, what some people call the back of the blade. It's going to throw the sawdust away from you. If you're doing this, 
you're getting sawdust not only over you, maybe in your eyes or whatever. And if you do it to the back, it actually works better as far as getting you around the tree. So I'm gonna go real slow on this first one. Try not to go too deep. And I'm gonna, you'll see that the sawdust is going to go away from me. See how it's shooting out that way? So again, you're just going through the bark. You're not cutting the tree down. Just get to the canby mark. And because of a split tree, I need to start over here. Get me a little bit more distance here. And remember, I overlap by about an inch and a half. You don't have to hit the same line, but you got to overlap. The cambium is not making an S around that. And that's it. And then I will do the other one real quick. Now, you want to apply the herbicide within five minutes or less. So let me get this other one treated real quick. in the line. Put a little herbicide, that tree's done. Walk away. So Tim's gonna spray. We haven't adjusted our herbicide ball yet, so you're gonna go real slow and see your stream. I would open up just a little bit more. You, you don't have to spray a lot. Just one trigger go a long way. Just be moving your bottles as you go. One trigger goes a long way. Double trees are tougher, obviously, but it's a great one to show. And you can clearly see the herbicide die, see where my cut overlapped. Not a lot of dribble going on down through here, all the way around the tree. So much better than going, well, I think I'm gonna fall it that way and all that stuff. I wanna mention it doesn't matter the height, right? It'd be like if I cut my arm here or here, it's the same vessels more or less. So whatever your height is, wherever your comfortable, I like to do it a little higher because it's tough getting out the squirt bottle and making sure you're getting into the cambium layer. So I like to hold the saw a little higher this goes much faster. We're filming this is slow with two people than setting the saw down, getting a bottle, but one guy can do a lot in a day. A little squirt, that tree's done. I'm moving on. That tree's done except for herbicide application. <laughs> When you've got a sapling this close, might be in your way, go ahead and take it off. We're gonna treat that with our sponge brush. That baby won't grow up and be a brush pile here. Here we go. <laughs> Cedars cut below the bottom limb. Do not sprout back. I don't have to waste any herbicide on the cedar tree. Little trees like this again. Here's a hickory. Definitely treating that hickory. I don't want to mess with it. This is a weaned elm. If you don't recognize the bark, if you look right here in this limb, you can see the wings coming off. If I look over here, here's a big old fire scar. I'm just gonna cut this stump off, but not treat it and let deer consume the stump sprouts. I notice we're doing a single girdle in herbicide treatment. You've heard me or other people talk about double girdle. I found that single girdle with the herbicide gives you a much better kill rate, you know, 99% plus kill rate, so you don't have to come back. A couple things about this technique is you don't have to do it all in one day. I've had some experience. You may just start with the, you know, the weaned elms or the sweet gums in your area or whatever you have. 
take those out, wait a year or two, and then come back and see what else you want to take out. You can paint the canvas at your pace. This is pretty much a post oak forest right here, been high graded severely, so it's pretty easy. Leave the very best trees, terminate the rest. I see a little turkey scratching right here, but this is a pass-through area, and so many people we help have this. I mean, from Maine, you know, down to Florida, around East Texas, they have pass-through areas. You can improve your timber, maybe make some food plots along the way, I hope you do, and improve this, because if you look around, there is no nesting or brooding habitat. It's just a pass-through area, slow down when there's some acorns. You're going, well, I don't see any results yet, and it's gonna be a while before we show you results, because it, you're putting a milliliter or two of herbicide in some that weighs a ton or more. This is not like spraying grass in summer Roundup and a week later it's brown and wilted. This may green up this spring, but it's dead. It's terminated. So if you don't remember, we laid this plan out for our good friend Gary Reimer in Kentucky. And, uh, just a pass-through area. Well, we don't want pass-through areas. We want it doing some purpose. He implemented it and the results are stunning. We'll put a link to those videos in the description. Check those out, because if you want to see the after, instead of waiting for us, you can look at Gary. Gary killed a big old whopper buck this year. His buddies are seeing a lot of big bucks. He doesn't have that large a property. He's got a good food plot structure going. And that is what I call an ideal example of using TSI to improve wildlife habitat. Hey, wear your safety gear. You want to come home, as I always say, the biggest trophy we outdoors men and women can bring our family at home is us returning healthy. That's our number one objective. Have a good day and enjoy creation. Beautiful sunny day here in February, but more important than all that and better deer and turkey habitat, the most important thing you can do is daily seek the creator, read his word, and apply it to your life. Thanks for watching Growing Deer.